Tonight, on the machine that changed the world, a world where information flows across oceans and continents, some of it highly personal. You and I are counted and recorded and questioned and dossiered and filed. Probably more than any people on Earth. The world at your fingertips. Coming up on the machine that changed the world. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. Forty-five years ago, there was only one working electronic computer in the world. It filled a room and cost in today's money three million dollars. And people at the time confidently predicted that the United States would only ever need six such machines. Today, there are millions of computers used for so many kinds of things that it is tempting to think that the main act of the computer revolution is over. But this view might be the most mistaken of all, for something profound is happening. Millions of computers all over the world are being joined together in networks. As the machines talk to each other, they are transforming the ways in which people interact, challenging the social institutions which have served us well for centuries. For hundreds of years, we have recorded and communicated our thoughts as marks on paper. And stored them in places like this. The Library of Congress holds more than 27 million books. Hundreds of miles of bookshelves hold nearly the sum total of all human knowledge, and it's growing all the time. But today there is an alternative our ideas and thoughts can be stored as patterns of digital electronic pulses and processed by computers. In digital form, the contents of some 450 books can be stored on a single compact disk. In principle, all the words, pictures, and sounds in the Library of Congress could be stored on several rows of shelves. And there are other advantages. With books, despite the best efforts of librarians, only things which have been anticipated in advance and indexed can be found. When information is stored digitally, you can find anything in an instant. A title, subject, even a small phrase. Take the words, to be or not to be. The computer can search the 450 books for these words in a few seconds. Revealing that it occurs not only in Hamlet, but in six other works. The computer can do this because it has taken the rich world we experience through our senses and reduced it to its most elemental form, patterns of digital pulses, which are really just a lot of zeros and ones. The world of the computer is digital, has ones and zeros, and, and they're beautiful because they're perfect. They, they're always ones or zeros, they're nothing in between. The world around us is analog. It has all different values. It has my, when you look at me, you see all different colors and all different shades, and it's not ones and zeros. And so to take this world that we live in and put it in the computer, 
we have to change it into a digital world that the computer can understand and can store and process. So we take a picture and uh, break it up into a series of dots, or what we call pixels. With a black and white picture, black can be one, white zero. Other more complex ways are used to encode color. Once in this digital form, information is permanent, immune to the ravages of time. Once you've digitized a picture, you have a permanent record of that picture that can't age. Like if you took a photograph, uh, with, that would age over time and it would change its colors. Whereas when you change it to ones and zeros, you have a perfect memory of it. For example, when they um, clean uh, Michelangelo uh, Sistine Chapel painting, they're not sure whether they're really putting it back like it was back in Michelangelo's time. If they digitize it then, they'd have a permanent record and they'd know exactly what those colors had to be today. But perhaps the real revolutionary benefit of digitizing information is that it can be sent down a wire at the speed of light to anywhere, even your own living room. By the 21st century, the art galleries, the libraries, the universities and museums of the world could be open for anyone with a telephone. While this vision of a digital home is not available yet, more modest services are on the market. For a few dollars a month, without leaving your living room, you can shop for almost anything. Check a movie review. Or learn about exciting places. You can plan your next vacation or book your next business trip. And even find out what the weather is like. Nearly two million people use such services, which bring a world of information into your home. But you can, if you prefer, use the computer like Dave Hughes as a gateway to an electronic frontier. To connect to the world, all Dave needs is his computer and a device called a modem, which connects to the telephone network. And so you have to dial a person. Now it's starting to dial. It'll go through lots of switches. And if it's not busy, we'll hear it. And you get very used to learning the sounds of phones around the world. It's ringing correctly. Here it comes. Now these two high-speed modems are interconnecting. And now I am in Tokyo, connected with my ID on a system. And so I go into eSpace. Now, of course, there's about 6,000 Japanese on here, and about maybe 500 of them handle English well enough to come into the English section. So we're now in the English section. And there's some things to read here. After reading his mail on the computer in Japan, Hughes can hop to a different computer in another country with just the push of a few buttons. We are connected to Tallinn, Estonia right now. One of the things that's happening is this disappearance of place as an attribute. What someone has said, the passing of remoteness. You know, you're no longer remote. When I'm sitting in my basement at home before my terminal, I'm connected. I'm plugged into the world. The great thing about it, it's, it's computer-mediated form of communication in that I don't have to know who I'm sending the message to. I can send a message out there to someone who saw that movie last night, whoever you may be. And the computer network will find that person and, and give it back to me. OK, now let's see if I can get through to uh, Salt Rod, Norway, to a one-line bulletin board. Physically, Hughes hasn't left his chair, but his electronic presence has traveled half the globe in less than 10 minutes. This ability to receive and communicate digital information at great distances has led to new forms of social interaction. Billions of dollars, pounds, and yen pass back and forth each day between the world's financial centers. But no actual cash changes hands, 
Excellent. Only electronic pulses. Like it's 5,000 shares. Um, the stock is now up to 850, up 19. Okay, I want to get a, a price, please, in bats on the opening. Home Depot is a quarter air, 5,000, 15,000. Right, cancel the balance. This financial trader is in London. Okay. You get that rip? Well, what'd you... Well, actually, in percentage terms, that's a little bit of a... This one's in Boston. Yeah, okay. What do you want to do? Although they are over 3,000 miles apart, linked by computer networks, they are part of a global financial community, separated by space, but united by communication. It's amazing to me, having been doing this throughout the 80s and back into the 70s, that I can be sitting here and say the same thing. I am seeing exactly the same thing as someone in Paris, exactly the same thing as someone in London. There is no difference. I think that's amazing. I think that is absolutely amazing. When the New York Stock Exchange began 200 years ago, news of events in other parts of the world often took weeks to get to the traders. Messages could only travel as fast as the messenger. Today, the electronic markings inside the computer, which carry the news the traders need, can be sent down a wire at the speed of light. Gary. With their computers, traders are wired into the world. Distance is no longer an obstacle. Um, I think that's it for Italy land. How are you getting on in Switzerland? Institutions like the New York Stock Exchange are still at the center of much of this activity. Hundreds of millions of shares of stock are traded here every day. The orders to buy and sell huge numbers of shares are placed with middlemen called brokers on the floor. And they come from traders around the world who speak a language all their own. Uh, on the sell side, Bobby, General Electric, it's going to open up. Everything's going to open up. That's fine. Take advantage of it. I got 100 for sale. Uh, you know, maybe do 20 uh, if it's going to open nicely and then work the rest of the day. Have you got a report for us in ICI? I see they trade an eighth on the opening. They have traded right higher. Yeah. I don't know what your form is, but um, yeah. if we take the stock at two, we get a turn on it. Well, do you want me to do it for you? I've got no book. I'll do what you like. Yeah, well, if you could take him, well, up for 100. On the quota? The stock market, once buried under paperwork, can now handle as many trades in a day as it once did in a week. But do buyers and sellers who communicate through wires have any need for middlemen? In fact, do they even need a stock exchange at all? One day, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange may look like this. This is the floor of the London Stock Exchange. Once as bustling as Wall Street, today it is a horse-drawn carriage abandoned in the face of a new electronic age. In 1986, the exchange set up an electronic trading system to modernize the market. But to their great surprise, within a week, the floor was empty. Traders realized they no longer needed a central marketplace or its brokers. They could trade faster and more effectively from the computers in their offices. In the digital age, a physical stock exchange may simply be unnecessary. I was very surprised at the speed with which they, they left the floor. Indeed, it was somewhat embarrassing to us because we'd spent quite a lot of money on kitting out the trading floor with, uh, with screens in the expectation that the old culture would, would prevail and, and uh, people would wish to stay in physical contact one with the other. Computers which send, receive and process information offer a new way for people to interact. Hi there. Computers are creating new uh, social gatherings that are not geographic. The old town commons was just for those town people. But now we're creating comparable groups of people throughout the world, but they're united not by geography, but by some common interest. In the world of technology and science, we have many of these discussion groups around particular scientific and engineering disciplines. And we, we gather around this little electronic fire and, 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 and trade, trade wisdom. It's beautiful. Exchange of knowledge has been the cornerstone of scientific discovery and progress. For centuries, the primary means of testing and communicating new ideas has been to subject them to a rigorous review by the editors of scientific journals. 
Magazines like Science and Nature and others have become the arbiters of new claims and discoveries. Today, scientists have an alternative. Hundreds of thousands of scientists in dozens of different countries are connected via a worldwide computer network, Internet. It has the potential to change science, as a recent episode made clear. We've established a sustained nuclear fusion reaction by means... In March 1989, Sidney Pons and Martin Fleischmann made a startling announcement. They claimed they had discovered a new phenomenon called cold fusion, a potentially unlimited source of cheap and pollution-free energy. Scientists around the world started scrambling for more information. Apart from newspaper reports, there was little hard information. It would be weeks before academic papers came out. So scientists quickly turned to the network, convening a worldwide 24-hour-a-day conference of interested scientists from many countries. Information from different labs whizzed back and forth as digital pulses. I think it's pretty clear that there is cold fusion going on. There's much right to be skeptical and to talk about it. False leads were quickly abandoned, promising results pursued with new vengeance. Something which, in a conventional journal, would have taken months to resolve, progressed very quickly. Unfortunately, in this case, into oblivion. Computer networks aren't just for scientists and financial traders. Increasingly, they are being woven into the fabric of everyday society. And in the case of one woman, computer networks have changed her life. Theo Gruthoff has been confined to a wheelchair since a car accident left her partially paralyzed. Although she's learned to live with her disability, she still misses the simple pleasures of mingling with people in the outside world. But with her computer, Theo is now connected to a whole network of new friends through a system called SeniorNet. Started just five years ago, SeniorNet has become an electronic meeting place for more than a thousand senior citizens scattered throughout the U.S. and Canada. I need people. I cannot do without them. So at the, especially at the SeniorNet, I found people of my own age. I knew what they were talking about, and they know what I'm talking about. Colette. Have you ever heard of or been to the New Jersey... Dear Joan, place? such a worthy cause. Inga my I, I have no bread machines. I was just Dear trying to Will. poke a little fun. Isn't it maddening that people makers. think because the body is old and looks frail that the mind is too? The computer age has already come to enthusiasts, to scientists, and to financial traders. But all of our lives are touched by the new digital world. Whether we know it or not, we're all part of an electronic community in the sense that very personal information about us is gathered in one place, in a credit agency, in a police agency, in medical records, and frequently pulled together in ways that we don't even know about. Nearly every person in this country has an electronic presence, a compilation of the electronic traces we leave behind. Whatever we think of computers, Modern society depends on them. One of the great ironies in this is that we're supposed to be the freest country on the planet. And I think we are. But because of our technological sophistication in the field of information technology, we are probably the most dossiered people on the planet. Even in totalitarian states, they don't have the data wealth that exists here in the United States. You and I are counted and recorded and questioned and dossiered and filed, probably more than any people on Earth. Withdraw money from a bank. Your name goes to two computers. Get a driver's license. Four more computers can get information on you. Use a credit card. Your name is sent to as many as seven different computers. The information on your paycheck is sent to three different databases. Even if you're just sitting at home doing nothing, 
Your name will pass through up to 50 different computers in a day. It all adds up to an incredibly detailed picture of your electronic alter ego, one over which you have little or no control. One of the consequences of having computer networks is that you, you can actually allow information to get polluted and for the pollution to spread around, too. You can get wrong information in there. There's always wrong information uh, in, in a database. It's, it's almost impossible to prevent. And now you can get that wrong information tr transmitted around and shared, replicated, and, and acted upon. Before they electrocuted Mrs. Mabel Neville, she said these words for all to hear. Never Foreman Brown, a former Hollywood songwriter, is alive and well at age 90. If you like the setting for it, never, never buy a crystal set. But five years ago, he was dead, or at least his electronic alter ego was. Here I was in, you know, 85 years old and semi-retired and living pretty contentedly, and suddenly these checks appeared. Department of Water and Power and the mark deceased across my signature. And uh, that was rather startling, you know. <laughs> and of course, naturally, I went to the bank immediately to see what was going on, and that started all the ruckus. Brown left, assured by the bank that the matter would be resolved. But his troubles had just begun. Somehow, the rumors of his death had been greatly exaggerated, spreading to the computers of the Social Security Administration, which stopped issuing his monthly checks. Well, I went down and explained, here I am, I'm alive, and you've, you've cut off my Social Security because you say I'm dead. And she was, the lady was really rather rude, I thought. She was not about to look up anything. She said, we couldn't make such a mistake. Hard as he tried, Brown couldn't keep up with the rumors as they quickly spread from database to database. Everywhere he went, the data got there first. I was going to rent a film, and uh, I offered my American Express card, and the girl looked up. I say, you generally do to get the numbers OK. And then she came and promptly tore the card in two and threw it in the wastebasket. And it was embarrassing, because there were other people there. She said, your credit rating's no good. The final straw came when they stopped paying his Medicare payments. More than a year later, all the records were finally straightened out. But the memory of the experience still lingers with Brown. It just seems so little you can do about it. Everything is in somebody else's hands, and you have to rely on their goodwill to fix things, and eventually it works out, I guess. She would have to get a more distinguished mate. Oh, yes, she would have to get a more distinguished mate. Foreman Brown's ordeal is not an isolated case. Thousands of lives are disrupted every year by faulty data spread by databases. Trying to catch up with a piece of information, correct an error in the system, it's like running after a greased pig. Even if you get your hands on it, you're not going to hold it. If there's an error in your credit file, and that information has been given to three insurance companies, a medical information bureau, five credit granters, and six employers, you're never going to be able to catch up with it. A recent study of credit agencies by Consumer Reports found that nearly half of all files examined contained inaccurate information. One out of five files had major inaccuracies which could ruin a person's credit rating. It isn't just false information that can be damaging. Our electronic presence reveals many things about us which we might not want others to know. Normally, we decide what information we share with people. There is the most personal information we only share with our intimate friends. There are the things we talk about with our family and acquaintances. Hey, how was the picnic? It was fun. I'm glad I went, actually. I'm going to Chicago on the 10th, mm -hmm. evening of the 10th. There are matters we discuss with business colleagues. Emergence conference on the 11th. I'll meet Peter and the Johansons there. Now, what time do you get into And there are even things we are willing to tell to strangers. OK, so up about a block on my right-hand yeah. side. But there are few such choices in the digital world. Total strangers can scrutinize the electronic traces of our lives, the restaurants we eat at, 
the hotels we stay at, and the goods we buy. It isn't a case of, if you're innocent, why are you worried about what people will find out about you? It's a matter of self-knowledge, dignity, and the decision that each person should make which of his or her inner thoughts and feelings should remain private, subject to change and consideration, and which, in a sense, shall be a public snapshot that'll be recorded someplace, which will then establish you in the eyes of someone else in ways that are very narrow, shallow, and possibly false. So you would like to receive the product still? So the total package would be 29.90 for the bench buster and the bodyguard dining. All this data gathering has provided work for millions of Americans who make a living typing data about us into computers. Ironically, these information workers may be monitored more closely than anyone. For the work they do leaves a record, which means that someone in another office can, if they choose, monitor exactly what they type, how fast they type it, and when they stop for a break. Probably no group in the workforce is more closely monitored or has less privacy than the folks who deal with information. Because every aspect of what they do by the very nature of the technology is recorded. Uh, those people really live in a prison. They live in an informational prison. Uh, it's in the nature of what they do. Now, I can see and have believed for some time that employee privacy is one of the great workplace issues of the 21st century. For some employees, it has already become an issue. Harriet Tapitzes claims she has been monitored for years by her employer, TWA. This electronic timesheet details a TWA phone agent's typical workday. It shows how many calls she answered, how long each call took, how much time she paused between calls, and how long her breaks were, down to the second. Managers use these timesheets to reprimand workers for talking too long on the phone or taking too long a break. This is an electronic sweatshop uh, where you have uh, the sophistication of the computer uh, and management uh, demanding that you work harder and sure, faster yeah, continuously. That round trip airfare would be only $377. It's not a way that the human body can work. You break down just like a machine breaks down and that's the whole point here. They're trying to make robots of us. Not for the first time, a new technology has come into conflict with our social systems. Computer technology is changing at such an enormous rate. I mean, the technology is being overthrown about every three or four years. And social systems move much more slowly. So you get the computers moving like that and the social system just sort of creeping along. So there's always going to be a difference between the two. The greatest fear I have, the greatest fear I have, is that we become so comfortable with the technology, that we get so many benefits from the technology, that we are anesthetized by the technology. It may well be that we are ju just going to sleep, that we're just not caring or understanding enough to take that step back and say, wait, this is great stuff. These are wonderful machines but let's keep it on the plus side. Let's, let's make sure that we understand what the deleterious side effects are. Let's control the technology. Don't let the technology control us. Five eights for 500 ICS. As the financial traders have discovered, controlling a new technology is no easy task. Six hour, three, three, five, that's 78, that's 82, I leave 1,800 shares. Connected by computer networks, traders all over the world anxiously await the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange. In the frenzy that will follow, 
millions of dollars will be made or lost at the push of a button. Sell 10,000 Glaxo, 30 and 3 quarters. 31.4, Rich, 31.4. 64 and a quarter, please, with 12,500 ICI. 35 points on the upside. That's just the beginning. <laughs> it's a half the Gauders Depot, 1,000 more trades of 5 H. A half the Gauders, 2,000, 10,000 HD. The stock market has always been a hectic place. Today, with computers and computer networks, the market moves so fast that traders can barely keep up. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. On October 19, 1987, things got completely out of hand. They're calling it the Monday Massacre, the worst drop in Wall Street history. Hour after hour today, wave after wave of selling hit the stock market. A selling panic, the professionals call it. By the closing bell, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was in the steepest fall in its 103-year history, down more than 500 points. Computers kicked off some selling programs. Many experts believe that computerized trading, so-called program trading, was partly to blame for this disaster. In program trading, special computer programs spot trends and incite traders to buy or sell huge quantities of stocks faster than humanly possible. These trades, in turn, may be detected by other trading programs, triggering them to buy or sell. Very quickly, an avalanche effect can build up, causing wild swings of the market. Since the 87 crash, the New York Stock Exchange has imposed new procedures to intervene and, in effect, slow down computerized trading. A century ago, uh, it was weeks before you found out that there was a war going on across the sea. It took that long for the information to get over. And that, that told us something about, uh, about the pace of events. Today, this is getting squeezed down uh, to, to microseconds. Literally, something happens in Australia, an investor in New York knows about it and takes action just like that. Uh, we're getting so right now that we worry about the speed of light being, being a constraint on us. It takes 30 milliseconds to get a piece of information across the country. And we're worried, does this really make a difference that you're not going to find out about something until light gets there? That's how far we've gone with the information flow today. And the question is, are our social systems stable? when you turn the gain up and collapse this information flow. And we don't know. These are some of the anxieties which are beginning to cloud the dream of a computerized society. This place may well be first to find out whether the dream is turning into a nightmare. It has started one of the largest social engineering experiments involving the most complete use of networked computing. This experiment is not in Japan, the USA, or Western Europe but in Singapore. Ten years ago, few Singaporeans knew how to use a computer, let alone a computer network. At that time, the Singapore economy was built around heavy industry, steel and chemicals. Today, they have staked their future on information technology, IT as they call it. The government has ambitious plans to make Singapore a developed nation within a decade to become a global business and communication center, managing not only manufacturing, but information as well. Our vision is to evolve Singapore into an information society. In fact, I should say, the vision of the country is to become a developed country by the end of the decade, where we will have meaningful and vibrant economic activities with cultural activities, with high standard of living. And this vision that we have is providing a lot of excitement to various organizations. IT matters to us because we are working a very small and tight ship. We don't have millions of people to dispose of. We have relatively few digits. And every person must be performing to his maximum, which means that he must be supported by technology, by information, by networking. All over the island, work is done electronically through computer networks, be it business, medicine, or law. But this is only the start. 
In this room and others like it, an electronic alter ego is being developed for the entire island. In the past, information on Singapore only existed on land deeds or old maps, which were hard to find and harder to use. Now, Singapore is being digitized. Everything you want to know about Singapore is being gathered in a massive electronic database called the Land Data Hub. Everything about any particular building is there, how the power lines are connected, which phone lines it uses, which businesses are inside and who owns them. A social engineer's dream, this electronic alter ego is a dynamic record of the entire island of Singapore. For this society to succeed as an information economy, everything, including getting to and from work, must be done with electronic efficiency. From the moment passengers enter Singapore's modern subway system, their electronic alter egos are tracked by the system's computers generating a wealth of information for subway officials. Well, we know practically everything about the, uh, the uh, traveling pattern of a passenger. We know uh, where, he buys, where he buys his ticket, when he buys his ticket. We know uh, where he enters the station, what time he enters the station, what kind of ticket he uses, where he gets out of the station, or which station he gets out at what time. So practically everything we wanted to know. It's not just the traveling habits of Singaporeans that attract the attention of government officials. With computers linked by networks, the government maintains extensive dossiers on every Singapore citizen. Your attention, please. Passengers are reminded that it's an offense to smoke, eat, or drink in MRT stations and trains. The offense carries a maximum fine of $500 Please help us to keep the MRT stations and trains safe, clean, and comfortable. Thank you for your cooperation. The world is watching this extraordinary experiment in social engineering. How will the government balance the benefits of efficiency and prosperity with the loss of privacy? We've gone further than most other countries in the region in making use of information technology for a number of reasons. Firstly, we are small, so when we need to make a move, it's easy to get the whole country to be moving and, and pushing in that direction. Secondly, it's the way we are put together. Uh, we operate a system based on meritocracy and efficiency and on getting things done as sensibly and with as little fuss as possible and as quickly as possible. We do quite a number of things which Western governments probably would hesitate to do, either because ideologically they feel they should not intrude on personal lives, or sometimes because they just don't have the time to do it because the next election is too close around the corner. But it is a different society, and we have to govern the way the population needs to be governed and the way the population accepts being governed. In Singapore, the government has seen that information is power. Whether they use that information to accelerate Singapore's development or to control its people remains to be seen. In other countries with different political traditions, the power of computer networks has been used as a tool for democracy. After Singapore, the next most networked country in the world is France. But that wasn't always the case. Hello, hello? Hello? Oh. Ten years ago, when France decided to modernize its antiquated phone system, they installed a national computer network, Minitel, which people could tap into from home. In 1983, there was only one service on the network, an electronic phone directory. Today, there are more than 12,000 services. Minitel is everywhere, in homes, record stores. It's even at truck stops. 
Minitel has become an integral part of French society, just as the government hoped it would. But the government never expected that Minitel would be used against itself. In 1986, students around the country held a series of protests against a change in admissions policies at state universities. They hit on the idea of using a free propaganda machine, Minitel. We decided to use Minitel because the movement was all over France and we wanted a way to communicate quickly between organizers and universities. We also wanted to gauge the mood of the public. With the network, David Asseline and other leaders of the movement took their cause directly to the public, an instant publishing operation. In addition, they also used the network to organize various student groups around the country. Philippe, what happened yesterday at the protest? Uh, David, uh, 1,000 people came, about twice as many as last week. The police were a bit rough, but no one was seriously hurt. Christine, what is happening in Marseille? The newspapers did a story on us yesterday. It was mostly sympathetic. We're planning a demonstration for next week. With such efficient coordination, the leaders built the movement into a massive rebellion in less than two weeks. In Paris alone, more than one million people marched through the streets. Four days later, the government backed down and canceled its plans for reform. Before the students' triumph, few protesters had thought about using computer networks. Now, almost all large French protest movements, from labor strikes to political rallies, are organized by networking. In just 45 years, the descendants of this machine have permeated every aspect of our lives, be it politics, business, science, or just companionship from Singapore to Paris, from Wall Street to the city of London, the future is digital. Whatever you feel about computers, there is no going back to a world without them. We depend on computers every bit as much as we depend on the planes we fly in, the roads we drive on, and the bridges we cross. All these things support our complex ways of life. The problem is that bridges are made of steel and mortar. Build it strong and it will stay up. But the computer's foundation is less tangible. Computers depend ultimately on software, which can contain millions of lines of code, all written by human beings. Programmers work the way medieval craftsmen built cathedrals, one stone at a time. There's no equivalent of industrial methods of production. We don't have the software equivalent of interchangeable parts. We don't have the equivalent in building software of the assembly line. It's all hand worked. And that means you don't have the precision or the reliability uh, to be able to safely say, well, having built this, we think it works according to the specifications. Instead, you have to exhaustively test it. And there are always particular combinations of circumstances that somehow have eluded the test plan. And this inability to thoroughly test software can prove disastrous. Take the case of the Therac radiation machine, a machine for treating cancers. The computer program which controls the machine had been thoroughly tested. The machine itself had operated safely thousands of times. But when patient Katie Yarbrough underwent Therac radiation treatments for a cancerous tumor, things did not go as planned. She said, what's the matter? And I said, you've burned me. And they said, oh, no, that's not possible. This is the most sophisticated piece of equipment on the market and it's not possible for you to be burned. 
And a week later, I was totally paralyzed on the left side. Less than a year later, at another cancer center, a Therac machine malfunctioned again. Ray Cox was being treated for a tumor on his back. Six months later, he died. In fact, the Therac radiation machine had a software bug in it. When the operator made a mistake setting doses and corrected it in a particular way, the machine ignored the change and emitted a powerful blast of radiation. Instead of a normal dose of 200 rads, Katie Yarbrough was hit with 20,000. Since the installation of new software and extra safeguards, the Therac 25 has been free of problems. Faulty software in one machine is frightening enough, but when connected to a computer network, the potential effects can be devastating because nearly everything which happens in a network is controlled by software. It's curious about computer networks today. I think that they're very robust in one sense and fragile or vulnerable in another sense. You can go out and physically damage networks, drop bombs on them, cut lines, and they still work. And yet they're vulnerable to little information damages. They're vulnerable to mistakes in computer programs that run them. Imagine a program that has two million lines of code that are the instructions that run it. It's guaranteed that they're not all right, that there have to be mistakes in that. It's beyond human uh, possibility to make that entirely right. They're just waiting to happen. And on January 15th, 1990, happen it did. About 2.25 yesterday, Eastern Time, a software problem occurred in the network. Preliminary indications are that the trouble was in the, in the signaling system spread rapidly throughout the network. The AT&T telephone system, which had run for 30 years without a major hitch, was crashing. Technicians watched in horror as line after line began to fail. For customers, it was a day of frustration. Our circuits are busy now. Please try your call later. Nearly 20 million phone calls couldn't get through. And Companies which depend on the telephone system, such as travel agencies, suffered millions of dollars in lost business. After 18 hours of frantic searching, engineers traced the problem to a single line of bad software among the millions that control the network's computers. A small mistake in one of these millions of lines of computer code that governs the network was suddenly called into play. And one switch told another switch, do this and do that, and they were wrong things. And the next switch communicated it to another. And the network started talking to itself and babbling back and forth, and pretty soon it stopped working. The problem with software is you can never test it completely. I mean, you'd like to think that you've written this program and now you, you could test it to see if it works. But the problem is that there's so many possibilities for conditions, for, for the inputs to this program. There's so many what ifs, what if this, what if that. And you put a lot of what ifs together and you get just a myriad of possibilities. And, you, and so many, you could never test all the situations. The collapse of the phone system has led some people to wonder what else is at risk. For every day, we trust our lives to software. Take flying. Each day, more than a million Americans travel by air. The planes which carry them are flown with software governing everything from navigation to cabin pressure. And they are guided through the air by air traffic controllers who depend upon computers to feed them crucial data about a plane's position, speed, and altitude. On October 14, 1989, at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, something strange happened. Information on the air traffic control screens began to disappear. The controllers knew that they had to act fast. Lives were at stake. This is not a job where you can say, hold on a second while we get the thing operating again. The aircraft are still flying. They're still in our environment. They're doing 250 knots. And an aircraft can travel quite a distance over uh, in a minute, doing 250 knots. With planes circling overhead and no working computers, controllers were forced to rely on their memory 
and the only tools they had left, pencil and paper. It seems unbelievable we resort to pencil and paper, but those are real people in those aircraft, and, uh, and you have to resort to whatever means that'll help you remember that that aircraft's there and at what altitude he's at. The problem was caused in part by a poorly designed computer program coupled with an overload of traffic at the Dallas airport. Fortunately, no accidents happened during the computer crashes. But such computer software problems have occurred at many other airports. Software is fundamentally different from the other elements of our infrastructure on which we depend. Years of experience have taught engineers how to build safe bridges, and large safety margins are built in. It's unlikely that a modern bridge will come crashing down because of one tiny missed detail. But with software, that's exactly what can happen. Despite the best efforts of software engineers for at least 20 years now, a single misplaced uh, hyphen or, or a typographical error can cause an enormous program to simply come tumbling down and, as has happened in, in the past year, tie up the entire uh, long-distance telephone network. The tiniest little software error. If we're ever going to have true software engineering where this uh, activity, which is so important and is becoming more and more important to our lives, uh, is reliable, we've got to figure out a way to make programs uh, robust enough so that they don't come crashing down when you just have the tiniest little mistake in them. There is a remarkable irony. The story of the computer began 150 years ago because one man, Charles Babbage, was worried about the errors which human beings, called computers, made when calculating mathematical tables. Because engineers and navigators relied on these tables, mistakes could cause ships to get hopelessly lost or run aground. Babbage's analytical engine, the blueprint for the modern computer, was to be the answer, a machine which would not make mistakes. In time, the machine that Babbage dreamed of would indeed be built. It would compute numbers faster and more accurately than any human could, but it would also lead to things that Babbage could never have imagined. But ironically, all these wonderful uses of computers which today we depend on are still vulnerable to human error. For while computers don't make mistakes, the humans who program them do. We go forward into the future knowing this, but what kind of world will it be? Computer manufacturers certainly have their own ideas about the digital future. Most see computers getting smaller and more powerful. Keyboards will disappear, and one day we'll instruct computers with our voices. Some see a world where children bring small computers to school instead of books, and through them have access to a world of knowledge. What's it really look like? This is what a volcanic eruption looks like in real life. Intervals. Excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great. Many see the emergence of personas called electronic agents, which can anticipate our needs. You need to take Kathy to the airport by two. But all computer experts agree that communication will be a central element in the digital future. This is Mary. Hi, Mary, it's Fred. Fred, where are you? Sorry, I went to get a notepad. <laughs> I'll have to check. But these well, predictions may be as that? wrong as the remarks well, made in the late 1940s. Then people could only envision the world needing six computers. The computer is not a machine in the traditional sense. It is a new medium. Perhaps predicting the future of computers is as hard as it would have been to predict the consequences of the marks Sumerians made on clay 4,000 years ago. It's ironic when you look at the history of writing. 
to find that it began as a very utilitarian method of helping people remember how much grain they had. And from those very humble utilitarian beginnings came poetry and literature and all the kinds of wonderful things that we associate with writing today. Now we bring ourselves up to the invention of the computer. Very same thing is happening. Invented for a very utilitarian, prosaic purpose of doing calculations, the kind of relieving the tedium and drudgery of, of uh, cranking out numbers for, uh, for insurance companies or something like that. And now we begin to see this, this huge culture that's grown up of people who are discovering all the things you can do by playing with the computer. We may see a time in the not too distant future when people will look at the computer's impact on society and they'll totally forget its humble beginnings as a calculating device, but rather as something that enriches their culture in, in undreamed of ways, uh, just as literature and art uh, is, is perceived today in this world. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. <laughs>